Baseball season is in full swing as the Staten Island Ferryhawks soar into their second year with new coaches and players looking to build on the team's inaugural 2022 campaign. I want bodies moving fast, I want the ball moving fast, I want quick decisions. My goal is to have a really exciting product on the field, uh, day in and day out. Homer Bush coming in is an infectious personality. You know, I had a chance to talk with him for about an hour before the season. And um, this is a guy who literally wrote a book on hitting and his energy is just off the chart. It brings guys together. You, you talk to him and you want to run through a wall after talking to a guy like him. And I think his personality fits that and I know a lot better. And I think it will work a lot better with the guys in the room though. Where this is a guy who, yeah, he has major league experience. He played with the Yankees, he won a World Series ring in 98. But at the same time, he, he's really young at heart and kind of one of those guys who's always on the move and on the go. And I think he connects well with the younger guys a little bit better than Edgardo did. Welcome to the Staten Island Advances from the Scene, a podcast bringing you an inside look at the biggest stories on Staten Island with the reporters who cover them. I'm your host, Eric Bascom, and this week I'm joined by Staten Island Advance sports reporter Nick Regina to discuss the start of the second season for the Staten Island Ferry Hawks. Thanks for joining me today, Nick. I'm always excited to have you on to talk baseball. It's a lot more fun than uh, some of the stories that we're usually talking about here. Before we jump into the uh, the hometown team, I was wondering kind of your thoughts on the Mets and the Yankees so far this year. We're, we're a couple weeks in now. Eric, thanks for having me, man. Good to be with you. Um, definitely. Um, I know it's been a little up and down with the Yankees and Mets, uh, to say the least. I'll start with the good. Um, I, I think the best thing about both teams so far this year is that they brought up the kids, right? Mm-hmm. Uh, Anthony Volpe for the Yankees at 21 year old kid playing shortstop every day and uh the Mets didn't do it out of camp but it's good to see Brett Beatty and Francisco Alvarez in the lineup every day now a couple of young guys it's rare that we get that in New York to see so many young prospects up uh, early in the season we don't really usually get that the bad though is uh, the injuries for both sides right the Yankees seem to be decimated every year mm-hmm. um no Aaron Judge right now no John Carlos Stanton just to name a couple of guys no Carlos Rodon so they're missing a bunch of guys the Mets uh on the bright side are getting a couple guys back right we get uh, Max Scherzer back this week go uh, from suspension Justin Verlander back off injury hopefully so uh maybe two teams trending a little bit in different directions right now yeah, you know, I'm a, I'm a Mets fan, so I've been following them a little bit more closely, and I'm very excited, like you said, that they're kind of letting the kids play now. As you said, the pitchers, uh, it's been tough for the Mets. This is something that's been such a, the starting pitching specifically, been such a strength for them in recent years, and, and with the injuries to, to Carrasco and to uh, Verlander, and even, uh, who did we bring in the Alcantana in the offseason? He hasn't pitched yet. He's going to be out until at least July. So uh, something that was once a strength, it's now we got one of the worst starter ERAs in baseball. Ball, so they're going to need to figure that out. Hopefully Verlander will help. Hopefully getting Scherzer back will help. And uh, uh, we'll, we'll kind of see how it goes. It's still early. They're both in, in, in decent position. The Yankees may be a little tough with that division this year. I mean, I, they're in last place somehow. Everyone's above 500, but somehow they're in last place with the Orioles playing well. You got the Blue Jays and all that. So it's uh, it's going to be an interesting one. But let's let, let's get going on the Ferry Hawks here. And for you know, the, the people who haven't listened before and the people who don't really know too much about it, we did a podcast last year around this time when they were starting their first season. But uh, I just want to recap a little bit for the for the, for those people who may not know. So the, the Ferry Hawks are obviously a new team here. We used to have the Staten Island Yankees here for, forever. And then they went away when the MLB kind of strengthened the minor league system. They, they ended up getting cut. So just tell us a little bit about, you know, who the Ferry Hawks are, how they got here and, and, and all that kind of stuff. Yeah, so I think the biggest misconception with the Ferry Hawks is that people think they're a minor league team. Um, technically, they're an independent league team. Mm-hmm. No affiliation with the Staten Island Yankees or the New York Yankees or any major league organization. I think that's one of the things that kind of makes the Atlantic League uh, unique and cool in a lot of ways. Um, that it's not this buttoned up. It's professional league, but it's not this buttoned up uh, MLB affiliate. Um, so the writing was kind of on the wall for the Staten Island Yankees for a couple of years. Uh, once the minor league contraction hit, we lost dozens of teams across the, across the national landscape. Um, and then we were kind of left here with this big ballpark in St. George and no one to play in it. Vegetation was growing on the infield. It was kind of rotting away for a couple of years there. And the Ferry Hooks stepped up and got those guys in there. And now we have a, a baseball team on Staten Island again. Which is very exciting because like you said, we've got that great ballpark there. You've got the, the Manhattan skyline in the background. I mean, it really is just a beautiful backdrop. Um, something that's been such a big part of the community for, for so many years as well. I mean, I know a lot of kids, uh, myself included, when they're playing high school ball, you get the chance once a year to play at Staten Island. 
now in Yankee Stadium. It's a big thing for for everybody. So it, it's nice to see that finally getting utilized again and, and for the right purpose, right? For baseball games, which is which is what former borough president uh, James Otto is a, was a very big baseball guy. He was, you know, really pivotal in this kind of push to to keep baseball here on Staten Island. So so props to him for doing that. And uh, I want to talk a little bit about that first season. So it, it could have gone better, right? I would say is is, is kind say of come one way to put it, <laughs> right? And so uh, just tell us a little bit about uh, kind of how they did, how they performed, and, and some of the challenges they faced because they were really putting this team together from scratch. One of the biggest challenges with the Atlantic League year in and year out for any team, but especially a first-year team, is uh, putting together a roster. Um, it's nothing like major leagues or minor leagues where guys, you have them and they're under contract and they're there to stay. A lot of these guys come and go, even within a season, um, we're even seeing just this week, uh, they're, they're still adding guys. Uh, we're a couple games into the season now. They just signed a couple more guys this week. So the roster is always uh, in flux, uh, to say the least. Um, a lot of guys who started last year didn't finish the season with them. Some guys joined at the end of the year and they're back this year. And that's just kind of the tail of the tape in the Atlantic League. Where, uh, there's just a ton of turnover, even, even in the season. To say the least, they struggled last year. Uh, they finished with the worst record in the league, 48-84. They were significantly better in the second half. They still had their struggles and challenges, but I, I think the, the big issue for them last year was getting so many guys into the locker room uh, a couple days before the season. They had Julio Tehran was the ace of the staff last year, and they were getting him down to Charleston uh, it, it, separate from the team. He was on his on, in a car driving down there to meet up with the team 24 hours before opening day and then getting on the mound. So. Uh, they definitely had some some struggles in that department, and and it showed on the field for sure. And, and not only just on the field in terms of the product, but also in the stands, which uh, you know we saw that they were last in the Atlantic League in attendance. So they were what was it, an average of just over twelve hundred fans per game there. So that's something obviously they're hoping to improve on this year. And I think kind of the continuity, people knowing a little bit more about them, people uh, you know realizing that there's baseball back on Staten Island. Hopefully that'll kind of tick up this year as well because I went to a couple games and you know it I mean I'm obviously I'm someone who loves baseball but it was still fun it's a great park they've got cool amenities there they've partnered with some of the local businesses to, for you know food and drink options and all that kind of stuff their merch is is uh, honestly pretty good in my opinion I know that's a big thing with the minor league and independent league teams is trying to find a way to market yourself and and proper branding and and, and sell some hats and some t-shirts and I think that they're they're moving in the right direction there and now Hopefully they can improve on the field a little bit and then that'll help them kind of draw a bigger crowd and, and you know, we can kind of get the stadium back to what it once was when it was uh, the Staten Island Yankees were really in full swing and they were drawing, you know, a couple thousand for each game. So, you know, you, you talked about the roster struggles, right, which is something that these teams struggle with every year, really. But tell me about some of the players coming back from last year's team that the fans might remember and, and, and might see when they go out to a game. Yeah, first I'll say uh, the, the big challenge last year was weather for them, and we're already off to a tough start in that department. They've had a couple games washed out due to rain, um, but the ballpark's in good shape. They got new seats, field looks great, so hopefully they can get some more people in the in the seats this year. But uh, going back to the returning players, um, the biggest name I'm sure that everyone knows is Kelsey Whitmore, the mm -hmm. first woman to play in the Atlantic League. She's back. We were told that she's going to get a lot more playing time this year. I'm not sure if that's going to come on the mound or in the outfield, but expect to see her in the lineup uh, a lot more regularly than last year. A couple Staten Island guys returned this year. Kevin Krause is a big bat, uh, Tottenville product, played in the Pittsburgh Pirates organization. He only played a handful of games with the team last year. Uh, they had a little bit of a falling out where they parted ways uh, a month into the season. But Kevin's back and that's a big bat in the lineup. He was hitting third the other night. Vin Aiello is a, a big arm out of the bullpen, um, another Staten Island guy. And then two big bats returned, probably the two best hitters from last year, uh, Ricardo Cespedes in the outfield and mm -hmm. Angel Aguilar, uh, probably the biggest. Uh, he, he, he just plays good baseball, that guy, man. is a, a shortstop, formerly from the Staten Island Yankees system. So a guy with minor league experience, and uh, he was a 300 hitter for most of last year. Made the All Star team, so a couple couple big bats return. Yeah, and so hopefully, kind of that 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 continuity is is starting to build. Maybe a little bit of team chemistry, and and having so many players kind of coming back will will help them. Uh, just kind of find their groove a little bit this year, which it seems like they were never even uh, able to do last year. Like you said, they improved a little bit in the second half of the season, but it never really felt like they got rolling in the way that they probably would have liked to. So so maybe a little bit of uh, continuity and chemistry will help there. And so we'll be right back.
The Mayor of Maple Avenue is a powerful multi-part podcast about Sean Sinisey, a victim of former Penn State football coach Jerry Sandusky, who was arrested 10 years ago for numerous child sexual abuse charges. The podcast series is written and hosted by Pulitzer Prize winning reporter Sarah Gannam, who takes listeners into the world of addiction rehabilitation, where society can be quick to celebrate the consequences for abusers while not addressing the needs of their victims. Subscribe now to The Mayor of Maple Avenue wherever you get your podcasts. What about the new players? There's got to be some new people, I imagine, coming in, joining the team this year that uh, that people should look out for. Definitely. Um, anyone who watched on opening day saw probably the biggest addition is uh, Kyle McGowan. He's, he's going to be the ace of the staff, it looks like. Uh, went five innings on opening day, struck out 11, uh, was throwing a no-hitter when he came out of the game, but... Uh, we were talking a little before. He's a converted reliever. Um, mm-hmm. He's got some major league experience with the Washington Nationals. Um, he's in his early 30s. He was a fifth-round draft pick. So this is a guy with some real arm talent and uh, definitely uh, a guy who can hopefully anchor a rotation. Um, another guy uh, Yankees fans might remember, uh, James Pazos, a reliever, kind of a journeyman reliever in the majors, um, getting another crack at this. Um, maybe a guy who's got a shot to get back on a major league roster at some point. But uh, not a ton of big names this year. There's no Julio Tehran, like that big major league name yeah. that everyone knows. But there's definitely a lot of, uh, I guess, scrappies probably the word. Guys who are looking for a second chance at a, maybe a big league dream or getting to latch on with a minor league organization. Yeah, and that's something that we see a lot with the Atlantic League, right, is is those people who are trying to kind of build back up their career. And, and maybe, you know, they had kind of washed out in the minors or, or maybe they were getting older and they'd retire. I mean, the Long Island Ducks, right, we got Daniel Murphy, as the my fellow Mets fans will remember. He's, he's staging a little comeback over there in Long Island. Um, so we'll see how he can do. But he, So that's a lot of the types of players I think that you're going to see, generally speaking, is those guys who, who couldn't quite hack it but still think they have that chance and and you know it's it's exciting to watch because these people are really playing for something right they're 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 not doing it because they're making a million dollars they're doing it because they want to do it and that's their their dream that's their goal that's everything that you know they've worked so hard for their whole life so it's it's cool to kind of see those guys leave it all out in the field in that way absolutely yeah i i think i think everyone's kind of on the same page in that regard in the atlantic league i think guys know whether it's coaching staffs or front offices that this is kind of a stepping stone towards a, a bigger a bigger opportunity. Um, Tehran last year, we, we saw him spend half a season last year, and then he got an opportunity in the Mexican League where he's probably making a little bit more money and getting some more eyeballs on him. And I think that's the end game for a lot of these guys is maybe getting a bigger opportunity uh, with, a, with a big league club at some point. Yeah, and that's something that's also cool about, uh, you know, with, with minor league games, I know, and even in this case, potentially with independent league games, is though you go to these games and you watch these guys, especially the younger guys who are coming up, and you're like, maybe I'll see him in the majors one day, and then you do, and you're like, oh, I remember that guy, I was 10 feet away from him down the first baseline at the at the Cyclone Staten Island Yankees game, or whatever kind of thing, so... Uh, I, I think that that's a part of this type of baseball that that a lot of the fans really enjoy. Let's uh, let's move on though and talk about the managerial change, which I thought was a little interesting. So just one year in, they're already changing managers. They had formerly had Edgardo Alfonso, who Mets fans will remember from those late '90s, early 2000s teams. The pitching coach too was Nelson Figueroa, who also used to pitch for the Mets for a while uh, in kind of more of the mid 2000s. But they kind of you know changed the guard after after just one season. They've moved on. They've hired a new manager, Homer Bush. And so it, it talk to us a little bit about kind of what went into the decision of, of changing managers so quickly and then a little bit about our new manager. Well, I'll start with Figueroa just to hit on him first. Um, he's with the Long Island Ducks now. He's the pitching coach over there. Um, they're a little bit uh, like a taxi squad for the Mets almost. They're just a ton of former Mets guys over there. You mentioned Daniel Murphy. But going to the managerial change, um, we didn't get a ton of clarity on why the change. I can tell you just from being around the team a little bit that there was... Definitely a, a little bit of a divide maybe between the players and Alfonso. You know, him coming from a major league background and he was a minor league manager. He kind of brought more of a buttoned up approach that maybe maybe fits well in a more of a professional setting than the Atlantic League where everything is so in flux and there's a lot more promotion and fanfare than, than baseball sometimes. And I think that maybe didn't jive too well in the locker room. I, I, just from talking with a couple of guys, I got the sense that it was maybe a little bit of a divided room. But um, Homer Bush coming in is an infectious personality. You know, I had a chance to talk with him for about an hour before the season. Homer Bush is the manager of the Staten Island Ferry Hawks. I want bodies moving fast. I want the ball moving fast. I want quick decisions. My goal is to have a really exciting product on the field. Uh, day in and day out. 
this is a guy who literally wrote a book on hitting and his energy is just off the charts like it it brings guys together you, you talk to him and you want to run through a wall after talking to a guy like him and i think his personality fits that and a lot better and i think it'll work a lot better with the guys in the room though where this is a guy who yeah he has major league experience he played with the yankees he won a world series ring in 98 but at the same time he, he's really young at heart and kind of one of those guys who's always on the move and on the go and I think he connects well with the younger guys a little bit better than Edgardo did. Yeah, and that's a big part of, of coaching in general in any sport, right, that goes a little underrated, right, is that it, obviously there's the X's and O's and there's the setting the lineup and making the pitching changes and, and all that kind of stuff, but you, you do need your team to rally around you in a way. You need to be able to inspire the, the, the group of players that you have out there, and, and if this is someone who is doing a better job of that, then maybe we'll see that translate on the field, even if it's not, you know, even if his X's and O's aren't uh, necessarily any better or worse, just the, the players believing in him and kind of buying into his message can can play a big role. We, we've seen that, like I said, not just in baseball, but really across any sport. Sometimes things get stale. Sometimes personalities just don't mesh. And so I'm interested to see kind of uh, if they adopt that uh, that infectiously happy personality that uh, that he has and kind of how that'll play out throughout the season. We mentioned earlier that last year the, the the tough record, one of the I think the worst record in the league, right? So so really struggled in a lot of regards. What were kind of the big things that that kind of held them back last year, and what do you think that they need to do to improve on that this season? I think consistency, and it's easy to give a, a really simplified answer here because they they need to improve on everything from last year, right? Um, um, but I think going back to Homer, just like we're still getting a feel for this team, he's still getting a feel for the team too. A lot of these guys are still meeting each other. We mentioned that a couple of guys just got signed this week, so they don't really have a spring training like the major leagues where they get six weeks to take a look at these guys. So some of these first week lineups, I'm sure, are going to be very different every night. I'm sure he's still getting a feel for who fits where, who plays best where, and and how he's going to work all that together. But the simple answer is definitely consistency. Um, it's easy to dumb that down because last year at times they pitched well and they didn't hit well. At times they hit well and they didn't pitch well. It seemed like they never really put it together. They had a two-week hot stretch in the middle of the summer. And uh, just to remind everybody that the season is, is split into two almost where they do a first half standings and a second half standings and then it all combines into one at the end. But if you win one or the other, you, you wind up making the playoffs. If they get off to a better start this year, which... They're, they're off to an 0-2 start, so not not ideal, but hopefully they can find some more consistency, and it looks like they have an ace pitcher at the front end of it, so that should go a long way. Yeah, absolutely. Having that that ace at the top of the rotation is so big. We see that in the MLB all the time, too. It's a, call them a stopper sometimes, right? When you go on those little bit of losing streaks, it's like, okay, well, we can throw Verlander out there now. Maybe he can get us a win, and so you, you, you avoid those prolonged streaks when you have one or two guys in the rotation who can really give you a quality performance if someone can give you six or seven innings a run maybe none and and it just kind of it helps you get right right and then it, it, you can kind of build from there with the with the rest of the rotation and the rest of the team so hopefully that'll that'll help them uh, avoid some of those longer losing streaks that we had seen in the past and and let them put together uh, a more respectable record i guess this year another thing i wanted to touch on so this is uh, kind of a cool part of of attending you know minor league games and independent league games really but the fact that the MLB has kind of decided that they're going to use this as a testing ground for all of these different rules that they might want to implement and so if you if you watch major league baseball you'll you'll notice that this year they've actually implemented a bunch of those rules on the major league level we've got the bigger bases which we've seen more steals as a result of we've got the pitch clock which has the games moving a lot quicker these are all things that in the past were tested in the minors and the independent leagues and then once they see that it's successful, okay, it's ready for the majors. So there are some new rules this year too, right? That they're testing in the Atlantic League that they might, you know, eventually end up seeing on Mets and Yankees games. So can you tell us a little bit about what it is that they're looking at this year? Yeah, so the Atlantic League kind of brands itself as MLB's official testing site, so to speak. Um, so we've seen a number of rules come out of there. You mentioned the pitch clock and the bigger bases. One thing that we're seeing at the major league level this year, I don't know if people have noticed it with the pitch clock, is pitchers can't disengage from the rubber more than twice in an at-bat. Mm -hmm. um, so in the Atlantic League this year, they're going to be testing out if they can pull off once an at-bat. Um, oh, wow. So it, it, that'll speed up games even more. We'll see what the feedback is from pitchers and how it works, but it's a perfect opportunity to test something like that in a league like this where 
the games tend to run a little long anyway, so if we can shorten them, by all means. Um, but that's that's one of the big ones that I'll, I'll be keeping an eye on this year. Another one of the, the returning rules that they tried last year is um, the double hook DH, they call it. I don't know if this one has legs for the major leagues because we just got rid of pitchers hitting a couple of years ago. But uh, this, the way this rule works is if the starting pitcher doesn't go five innings, you lose the DH and the pitcher has to hit in that spot. Just a unique little little play on the game that just makes things a little interesting. And um, another one that kind of reminds me of like a men's league rec rule <laughs> is um, the designated pinch runner rule. You know, like in a men's league, yet your catcher gets on base with two outs, you can pinch run for him. In this league now, you'll be able to designate a guy on the bench who can pinch run at any time for uh, for once a game and if he comes in for that guy he can that, that guy can return to the field afterwards um so you don't lose the player if he's pinch ran for so just a couple unique little things um that you know maybe eventually we'll see at the major league level who knows yeah that last one is interesting to me it does definitely sound like kind of like a beer league softball kind of kind of rule so i'm not sure the the latter two i'm really not too sure about the first one i think is interesting because the disengagements thing we've already seen with with that rule in the major leagues with the with the twice per at bat is that it kind of i mean if you disengage twice you're kind of then at that point the runner's got a head start he it's very easy to steal the base once the pitcher is already disengaged twice you're basically as soon as he twitches you can just go and so if you change that to once i mean we've already seen the the number of stolen bases in the majors go up this year between the the bigger bases which helps obviously you're cutting down the distance between the bases a little bit even if it's only six inches that's in baseball game of inches right that's always the the cliche but that, that makes a big difference and then the disengage thing so i like the the fact that teams are running a little more i think it makes for more exciting baseball the uh the pitch clock has also got the pitchers moving quicker which has kind of benefited the hitters we've seen a bit um and so uh, anything to get people kind of moving around on the base pads is is pretty good for me so i i, I like that one yeah i'm a big fan of that one i i love the guys running this year in the major leagues mm -hmm. um we've seen it with a guy like volpe um on the yankees who's getting these huge secondary leads from these new rules where you can only throw over a couple times per at bat i'm a big fan of it uh, we're both old enough to remember when guys were stealing 40 bases you'd have a dozen of those guys every year and now right. we get one or two if that um so I, I like seeing the speed reintroduced to the game and a little bit of a different dynamic from the uh, strikeout home run, home run walk outcomes that we've gotten used to. Yeah, exactly. And so uh, another thing I wanted to touch on, this is kind of a cool partnership, and and I should say that the Ferry Hawks have done a great job in general since since last year when they were really just getting started of, of partnering with the community in so many different ways and working with different organizations, different restaurants like we've talked about in the, in the ballpark and all these things. But so this year they're doing a radio broadcast partnership, which is going to allow some students from uh, CSI and from Farrell the opportunity to, to call the games right over the radio and I just thought this was a really cool idea because I'm someone who when I was in college I did a little bit of broadcast stuff with our, our college basketball games and all that kind of stuff and it it's such a cool opportunity right and so can you tell us just a little bit about about this program yeah before I get into that I, I we should commend um, the president of the team Eric Shuffler and the general manager Gary Perone because one area that they really have hit a home run in is community engagement I don't think anyone can deny that whether whether they're playing well on the field or not they've done a great job off the field and going back to the broadcasting partnership uh, kids from Monsignor Farrell and College of Staten Island will be in the booth for all 63 home games this year um, so that that's huge um, it's something I you mentioned you had the opportunity to do it I had the opportunity to call a couple baseball games when I was at St. John's if that was something that was available to me in high school that would have been awesome um, you know, I, I don't think people realize how hard it is to call a game until you get in there and do it. Oh my God. Um, it's a chore to say the least. It's, mm -hmm. it's, a, it's a mouthful. But I, I think for these kids, it's a remarkable opportunity to get in there at such a young age and be able to eventually walk into a college setting or a professional setting and say, I've done this before, um, gives you a real leg up on the on the competition and there's plenty of it. Yeah, no, that that's the big thing I think is that as early as you can possibly start practicing this stuff is you should because it is so difficult. It requires so much prep work in terms of before each and every game, making sure you got your little cheat sheet filled out with everything you need to know, everything you want to reference. But then also just being in the moment and as I did it with basketball and that's a fast game and, and people like to think sometimes how oh, baseball is a little slow and so you got a little more time to breathe. You don't have to, you know, think on your feet as quickly. There's still a lot going on and when that ball gets hit, it's everything all at once. And so it, it's not an easy thing to do. It's something that you should practice as much as you can, as early as you can. And a lot of people, the, the guys we hear in the majors, right, like these are people who 
who cut their teeth doing minor league stuff, doing college stuff, doing all this. So if you can say you started in high school and then you're doing it in college and then you do a couple of years in the minors, just starting as early as possible, I think is so important. And I think it's great that the team has uh, has made such a conscious effort to engage the the, the community and, and make sure that people have those kinds of opportunities early on. So. I really wanted to to kind of shout them out for that one. I think that that was uh, one of the cooler things that they're that they're doing this year. Yeah, and and you mentioned the speed of a basketball game. Sometimes that almost makes it tougher for a baseball game having that dead air or that dead space. Mm-hmm. And the other tough element of it is it, it, these aren't major league guys with household names. So yeah. sometimes you're looking back and forth at a sheet as a ground ball is going to third base, looking at the third baseman's name, trying to figure it out. So uh, definitely a challenge for those guys. But uh, that they, they have a good opportunity in their hands and uh, to be in the booth for 64 games is a a a great resume builder yeah absolutely and so one last thing i wanted to kind of touch on before we go you you mentioned before that uh you know the atlantic league and and minor league teams as well are are always really focused on some of these uh fun promotions and different types of events and and special nights and things that they can have throughout the year to try and get people out to the ballpark and and just kind of mix things up right it's not just like you're going to a baseball game but there's also this going on or that going on and so uh, I was wondering if you could tell us a little bit about the different things that they have planned on on this year's promo schedule. So, uh, without getting too specific, um, they have a bunch of T-shirt giveaways. Um, it's Heritage Nights, Italian Heritage Night was a big one last year. Mm-hmm. Um, they host a lot of the local little leagues, um, getting back to community engagement, um, and they, they give a lot of money back to those little leagues. Um, but the the big one on the calendar this year will be uh, August 11th and 12th. Um, the Savannah Bananas are rolling into town. Uh, they've They've gained a lot of national popularity, some notoriety from some people who don't love uh, some of the antics, but I think it's a, a riot, those guys. If you haven't seen them, they do some crazy things. Um, the other night, they were wearing giant hats and, and using them as gloves. They wear uh, cut-off crop tops, uh, crop top jerseys with no sleeves. Um, I've seen them set bats on fire and get up there and hit with them. Um, they do a lot of quirky dances. They're just an, a really outrageous brand of baseball, and I, I love that it's coming to Staten Island because I've, I've always wanted to see them up close, so that's something that I'm personally looking forward to. They bring back a lot of old major leaguers, too. I don't know if they have anything planned for when they're in New York, but uh, Johnny Damon played for them recently. Um, they pull a uh, 80-year-old spaceman Bill Lee out of the stands sometimes to throw some pitches with a beer in one hand. It, it's it's a crazy brand of baseball, and if you haven't gotten a chance to see the uh, the ESPN documentary uh, Banana Ball, it's uh, it's a, a pretty wild to say the least. Yeah, I think that that's the one that a lot of people are, are really most excited about. And I wouldn't be surprised if that's the busiest day at the ballpark this year. The the crowd is probably going to be, you know, real loud. The seats are going to be packed. Um, I, I just think it's funny, like you said, that they've gonna, kind of gotten this big national appeal just from viral videos online, right, of all these quirky, silly antics that they have going on in the game. I have people who, for, for example, like my, uh, my, my girlfriend's mom was like, Oh, did you hear the Savannah Bananas are, co- are going to are coming to Staten Island? They're going to be at Richmond County Ballpark. I was like, you don't even watch baseball. And she was like, we're going to the game. We're going to the game. So there's going to be people who are, they're not going to Ferry Hawks games necessarily, or they're not even huge baseball fans really. But just the the way that these people play, it, it's really kind of endeared them to a, a lot of people. And so they're they're now kind of touring the country. And we've got to stop here on Staten Island. And I think it's going to be very exciting. I'm going to make sure that I get myself to uh, to one of those games as well. Yeah, it's funny you mentioned that because I had a couple of buddies who sent me uh, the article that we did um, announcing that they'd be coming here. Uh, and they were like, hey, did, did you see Savannah Bananas are coming? And I'm like, yeah, yeah, dude, I, I did write the article. Oh, my God. Yeah, that's something <laughs> but, that we have. about everything. Yeah. yeah, so I know people are super excited for that. Um, obviously, they're based in Savannah, Georgia. I think they're on like a six-year sellout streak of selling out every game that they play at home. Um, so oh, I think you have to get on like a, a years-long waiting list to get a ticket to see them down there. So the opportunity to see them here for a couple nights. Um, I'm sure those tickets will go fast, so I'm, uh, I'd imagine that'll be the uh, the two chances at sellouts this year. Yeah, that's awesome. Well, thank you so much for joining me today, Nick. It's always a pleasure having you on, and hopefully the uh, the Ferry Hawks can have a, have a nice season this time around and improve on that record from last year. Maybe we'll even see them in a playoff game. Who knows? That's Thanks, Eric. That's what I was going to say. Maybe we can chat again if they make a, a playoff run at some point. Absolutely. Thank you for listening to the Staten Island Advances from the scene. If you like what you've heard, please make sure to rate and subscribe wherever you get your podcasts and visit SILive.com for the latest on all these stories and more. Thank you for supporting local journalism.